headbands and handkerchiefs, where business buying banter meets no BS reality. Get ready to dive into the world of buying and selling businesses without the fluff and fancy jargon. We cut through the BS to bring you raw, unfiltered insights from industry experts, seasoned entrepreneurs, and no holds barred discussions. They get straight to the point. Whether you're a seasoned business buying pro or a curious aspiring entrepreneur, this is where the real talk happens. Buckle up for headbands and handkerchiefs, because in business, there's no room for sugarcoating. Let's get down to the brass tacks. I love that music. I picked it. <laughs> you did? I, was, I did. Maybe we should get, have something that you sing. You know... I picked it. I wanted something that sounded bluesy and rock like Aerosmith because that's one of my favorite bands. Well, you, now we just got to well. get Steven Tyler back on the road again for their farewell tour. Oh, right, right, right. What is he in a rehab or where is he gone? A little of both, I think. So, yeah. Hey, you know, bands are small business, right? <laughs> or they're big business. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. The Taylor Swift tours, I think, gross a billion dollars. So, Oh, yeah. She's doing a lot for the NFL, too. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. No doubt. Yeah, and that's no a doubt. business. They're like, bring it on in. There's an affiliate for us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, she, you know, I think she's great. You know, as far as pers uh, personality is concerned, I couldn't name one of her songs if you put a hundred grand in front of me. But, you know, it, it only bothers me with during the games, like, okay, you know, what? you could in, instead of keep cutting to her cheering, you could show a few more replays. Like, <laughs> Yes. You know, like this, let's let's remember what we're here for. Oh yeah, my Super Bowl should be interesting. I wonder if uh, Usher. I think he's the uh, halftime. Um, I wonder if he'll ask Taylor to sing a song or two at halftime. Right, because she's I guess touring in Japan. I read, and then she's flying in for for the wow. the game. So yeah, I don't know. I think he'll. I'll think. I think he'll be happy to keep the stage to himself. Everything's a business, Richard, isn't it? Everything's a business, and there's a business for every business. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, welcome. It's good to see you. It's good nice to, to see, see you, my too. friend. I missed you last week, Thursday, but you are back. And, Thank you. Um, good to be back. I had a great trip. I think I told you, and anybody listening should look up Regenerative Capital Group, what they're doing. In, they're up based in Canada, but what they're doing is unbelievable. We talked about it briefly. They're underwriting five um, aspiring business buyers, paying them for a year. Um, they had 172 applicants, chose five people, and they're putting them through a rigorous training program. They flew them to Mexico for this boot camp, which was like, I mean, first class, five star. I mean, the way they took care of everybody was unbelievable. And wow. the founder of Regenerative bought my course a number of years ago. He and his partner started buying some small businesses, and they built it up to uh, over $200 million in revenue and sold out for $100 million. And he's taking part of that because he's such a good guy. And with this other gentleman, Cordell Jacks, and um, they're underwriting these five people um, to acquire businesses. So they're, they're, they turned them into Marines. So they brought me in for the educational component, leaving aside the insurance and some of the account and accounting, mm -hmm. but it was nine hours of boot camp, and they had all read the course be beforehand. And it was, it, it was great sessions. These are really, really impressive people. And it was a terrific back and forth. And um, so I, <laughs> the business part was great and had a lot of fun. It was they, they, they treated us like royalty. It was just incredible. I am more amazed at the fact, Richard, that it all started with your course. What what were they doing before the course? I mean, who one, yeah, one was a small time. On, um, Mike was in the financial business years ago, mm -hmm. and then um, decided was became a little more entrepreneurial. Uh, entrepreneurial. The fellow he brought in, Iggy Domagalski, brought him as a young fellow. Um, basically did in a different way what he's doing now, which brought him and said, let's look to acquire business. They bought a small company, I think. One of the first ones they bought, I think, was doing like 600 grand in revenue and mm -hmm. um, brought in and run the business. Then they bought some other um, similar ones um, that they amalgamated, um, not all of them into the fold, but a number of them. I'll have uh, Iggy's actually commentary. I had a long video session with him, testimonial, go on our website. Um, but they started just, you know, putting these pieces of businesses together. They're obviously very good operators. And it's great because, you know, with, with everything still says, you know, when he talks about it, he says, your course, how to buy a good business is a great price is the Bible. It's our Bible. It's timeless. He still uses the same seller question, still uses, um, you know, the go negotiating pieces. I mean, there's just a huge component. He says that that's their Bible when they're still buying mm -hmm. businesses. So it's, I mean, it's, it's unbelievably gratifying. I play just a little, little role, these guys, you know, obviously, but it's, it's really gratifying to see what, you know, you put oh, down yeah. words in a program and, and look what it leads to for these, 
these guys and you can find nicer people. So the whole story is, is terrific. Mm -hmm. I love it. And what a great segue for today's episode. I mean, team putting together a team for your business by side and, you were part of that team right out of the get-go for them, and you're still their team all these years later. Um, on the buyer side, right, Richard? You, you on the them. buy side. On the buy side, which for me, my biggest frustration, and for those of you listening who are aspiring business buyers, thinking about going on this journey, you're going to be a searcher, and we'll talk about searchfunder.com a little bit. Start forming your team before you start searching. That's what I got to say. Would you agree? Yeah. And, and you know, it's it's so crazy to me because I do some sell-side representation. Very often when I meet, you know, a, a prospective client or they become, a, 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 you know, an engaged client and we go through who their attorney and who their accountant is. And oftentimes, you know, they say, yeah, we have an attorney. And I've mentioned this before, you know, it's their, their brother and sister-in-law, the patent attorney. And I say, that won't work. We need an M&A attorney. And they're always, yeah, we, I, I get it. You know, that makes perfect sense. And we make sure the accounting, the accountant, sometimes they're working with a smaller accountant. It's not the right firm for a transaction. And we say yeah. we engage a bigger firm. And they're always amenable. I never, ever, ever get pushback on the sell side. It comes to my side. It's like people's brains drop out of their head when they're thinking about this. <laughs> I don't know why they think that they could either do it on their own um, or they don't put enough value into their team as far as an accountant, attorney, a fine, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a leader such as yourself um, and, you know, or an advisor, mentor on the buy side. I just, it just blows my mind that there's not the same um, level of understanding mm -hmm. on the buy side that the sell side understands. So people jump in, well, you know, and a lot of that plays into the fact that, you know, 94% of the people who begin to search to buy a business never buy one. You know, I always... Yeah over 90%, but it's actually 94% is the exact number. And they just don't put their team together. And yes, 100%, you got to do this at the beginning. Doesn't mean you have to hire them, pay them, engage them, retain them on the, but you have to at least know who they are. And right so on. Rolling in the conversation going. And that includes, you know, someone such as yourself, and you said, the, le the legal and financial piece and mm -hmm. buyer advisory side. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of confusion out there as well on the buy side. It has been for years. The difference between a small business transaction versus a middle market transaction. I've seen buyers come to the table with middle market corporate attorneys that represent the large transactions and they charge a lot of money for, for their work and they're, and they're engaged, they're engaged by a small business buyer. It's like, wait a minute. And then, then the total opposite, I've seen buyers just use a, a legal template that um, yep. the seller side provided. Maybe the seller broker said, just use this template. Or they found it online. Yeah. I mean, you, you get from one spectrum to the other. I don't think there's any in between out there. And somehow, Richard, we have got to change this market and shake it up a bit because quite frankly, I'm tired of buyers coming to these transactions completely unprepared and not knowing where to go. And the seller side, I could say the same too in the small business spectrum. So um, where should we start? I mean, if, uh, if what, I mean, as your course teaches, like the uh, investment firm that you just flew out and, and, and uh, did a presentation for them, what is the first thing that your course is telling people to do? Well, if we're, you know, if we're going to leave, you know, keep the subject matter consistent with the buying team, you know, one of the points you mentioned, if any, if you're going to err on the, if you're going to be, um, you're better off to err on the side of having uh, too many brains at the table than not enough. So if you're look, if someone happens to hire a firm that's a little out of the league per se, related to the size of the transaction, so a big law firm relative to a small acquisition, well, that's certainly much better than a small firm for a big, any ac for the wrong size acquisition. So always err on the side of brains is what I tell people. Yeah. Right? You can never have enough brain power at the table on your side, whether you're a buyer or a seller, that for yeah. your accountant, your attorney, you an advisor such as yourself. Um, so where they should start is if they don't, 
understand they're no, going to need an attorney. They're going to need an accountant. The rule of thumb related to attorneys, you don't sign, send, or submit any legal documents without it having to um, be uh, reviewed by an attorney. Mm -hmm. And so get them on board. You can have the discussions without retaining them. Tell me you're, you're looking to buy a business. Um, here's the size. Do you, you work on deals that size? Perhaps they don't. Maybe it's another firm that they'll recommend, but get them teed up. You don't necessarily have to engage them and pay them a retainer, but get them teed up and ready. And the same thing with the account and make sure, you know, ideally you want an attorney who's done work in the sector that you're looking to acquire potentially, especially if it's specialized, if there's, you know, I, um, IP or environmental issues, but making sure it's the right attorney. And again, you don't have to uh, give them money and have a retainer if you're just at the beginning of the search. Similarly with an accounting firm to mm -hmm. make sure that they're, and understand their schedule with an accounting firm because when it comes to certain tax periods or end of quarters, accountants are, are beyond belief busy, every accounting firm. So if all of a sudden you're going to turn to them to do diligence, you know, at the, you know, in September, September 15th, when they have to submit all the um, extended filings for corporate returns, they're not going to have any time for you. So make sure you understand what their schedule is going to be like. And the same thing, are they, you know, are they familiar with this type of business? Get their cost. You can meet with several, fewer, see who you're most comfortable with, but get them teed up. And as it relates to the financing side with someone such as yourself, you know, just give you, you know, um, sound like a good down and dirty plug for Deb Curtis. But the reality is, you know, you don't wait until you have a deal to figure out where the hell you're getting the money. And so getting someone on board such as yourself, that you do immediately. Yeah. Uh, because the financing is going to take time. It's not like a phone call to an attorney and say, we're ready to go send me the, send me the engagement agreement. You've got work to do. You got them to pre-qualify. You've got to let them know the criteria. So that piece of the equation for advisors is immediate. And then the knowledgeable piece, whether it's related knowledge related to buying, um, you know, on the advisory side, um, you know, I've been teaching and preaching people, you know, before you get going, get informed, be knowledgeable. Yeah. You know, right. I had one, you mentioned search fund. There saw a post the other day, someone was talking about an LOI and the response was something like, you know, just, you know, put in whatever you want. It's non-binding and that's complete full of shit because mm -hmm. an LOI can be binding. It depends what's in there. And, um, you know, maybe after we, we cover this point, we could talk a little bit more about the search funder type of websites of the world, but yeah. you, know, you got to get that, you got to get your people in place immediately. doesn't mean you have to start spending money, but from mm -hmm. the get go, that's your team. You want them in place. That's right. Um, I'd like to add that regarding talking with attorneys and before engaging them, I've seen some buyers come to me for financing and they already engage the attorney and put down a deposit. Yep. And then and then they show me the listing and we don't have anything. We don't it's not a qualified business that will pass bank financing. And you already put money down on an attorney, which I get it, I get it, but check first where the like you said earlier, where's the capital coming from? How do you know where it's coming from? And not all mm -hmm. banks are created equal. Right? right? Yeah, they're not all created equal and some deals can't go, back. a lot of them can't go bank financing. So how are you going to go about doing it? There, there are other avenues, but understand you don't wait till the 11th hour to figure out the financing. And that's what becomes so problematic with some of these buyers mm -hmm. is people have this, you know, either... Um, either their complete lack of knowledge or delusion that the banks are just going to open up the vaults and write them checks to, to make this acquisition. And you see it especially on the sites like a search funder where you have, their, these are unfunded searchers. I mean, they give them the name searcher. I mean, let's, let's call it what it is. They're a business buyer. I mean, they're, you know, it gave themselves a fancy name, which is, which is, which is fine. But, you know, if you have, you've never bought a business, you have no knowledge, you have no track record, you have no expertise, you have no experience. Who's financing you? Okay. And then you get onto some of these forums where you have all these people with no knowledge, no expertise, no experience, no track record, no nothing. And they're dispensing, receiving, and submitting and accepting advice from the same group community that's got no experience, no knowledge, no expertise, no track record. And so it's like, you know, it it's 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 a turning into a shit show. You're getting, you know, the, you. The, the 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 amount of misinformation, um, uh, wrong guidance is it's just crazy. It's like the blind leading the blind. You said it best. It is a shit show. Um, it's a shit show. I, I, I've i gone on that platform and seen some replies that buyers pose questions. And the replies are just, my head just 
spins at what I see. I'm like, where are they coming up with this? And it's either left or right. I mean, yeah. it's all over to hell. It's, it's certainly not bullseye. <laughs> now, you know, it is a terrific platform. I will say that. I mean, uh -huh. there's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of value for members in there. And I've spent a, a lot of time on there more recently than before. I mean, yeah. there is a lot of value and people can, you know, put together some good connections. But understand, take advice from believable parties. Mm hmm Right on. Right. You know, it's so, and, and that's where I see that becoming a really dangerous path when you're starting to take advice from people who are completely, um, you know, incapable. They, they just don't have the track record to be providing advice. It's like two people standing outside the mechanic shop. Both the cars are in the shop and they're each diagnosing each other's cars and neither one of them knows anything more than to get in and put in and drive. Like yeah. just take, find believable parties in financing, like yourself and attorneys and accountants, the best possible people you can afford, because this is what's going to help you get to the finish line. That's right. There, there was one question posed on the platform and I went against the norm um, as to what my thoughts were uh, on, on the answer. And um, the, the buyer reached out to me separately and thanked me because everyone nice. was going with the green, which was, in my opinion, the wrong answer. And uh, I, I was vulnerable. I knew because, you know, there's a lot of men in this space, not too many women. And I knew this girl coming in into the thread, throwing her feedback would probably raise some eyebrows. And well, you know what? The buyer was smart enough to contact me and think right. um, because he recognized that the advice that I gave was exactly what he was thinking about. Yeah, because it probably makes sense and they want it from mm -hmm. you're the believable party. And you brought up the point related to women. You know, years ago, when I went into the buy side of this in my program, I, my clients used to be like 95% male. Mm -hmm. Now it's about 70, 30 male to female. And I will tell you, okay, and I don't like, I'm not a general, like I don't like to throw out these general statements, okay? Mm -hmm. But I will tell you that women, by and large, much better business buyers, not even close. <laughs> no, and it's true. And I'm not just saying it because you're on the call. We're right here together. It's, and I've seen it repeatedly. And I think it's probably because a lot of the women that are looking to potentially buy businesses, they know they're going into the world, like the world of finances, the world of like the old boys network, right? Exactly. And they're going to, there's going to be a lot of men around the table. And so, you know, there's, there's, I'm not so sure. Let's say they're, they're being looked at a little differently. Maybe that is the case, but they're fighting this forever. And so what they do to combat that is they just make sure that they bolster their skill set and equip themselves with as much knowledge as possible so that they go in and there's never a question about whether or not they should be sitting at the table. It's no doubt. It's no doubt. I mean, and again, I, I, I don't want to be so such a generalist about it, but any one of my client, female consulting clients over the years have been more methodical mm -hmm. from the the, the acquisition of knowledge and the constant questioning and of, yes. wait, am I doing this the right way? And I don't think it's not from insecurity. It's from understanding that, you know what, there sometimes, you know, females start in second place, just just the real world where the way people look, you know, look at within the world of, of, of commerce because so it's so uh, male dominated. And mm -hmm. so they, they solve for that by making sure they they ramp up their, 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 their knowledge base quickly. And they go into this as, as a much better prepared buyer. And I've, I, again, I've seen it over and over again. Yeah, I, I think it's their due diligence. They ask more questions. They're not, they're not embarrassed to ask any question. No. I, I find that too, um, which is good. Well, oh, it's great. It, it is. It is great. Um, and they're, they're great. I, I think it's the mama bear in them, Richard, that, you know, they, it, <laughs> women typically are mama bears and, you know, we, we, we are moms or we were obviously, you know, children and we've seen mom taking care of us. We're just a little bit different on how we look at things. Um, probably I would say women move a bit slower for the right reasons where men want to move a lot faster to get the deal done and, and just make the money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could very well be, or they're just smarter, you know, just ask, you know, I just ask my ex-wife, she'll tell you that. <laughs> we like to spend money though, too. So we want to make the money. <laughs> Don't even go there, please. <laughs> oh, Although my, my, my wife is like, she, she runs a title office in uh, 
in Boca Raton for big firm out of your uh, area of the woods, Knight Barry. And, um, you know, she's, she's 100% self-sufficient, pays her bills, her car, she wants a nicer car, whatever, she takes care of everything. So it's, it's ne- that, that is as, as equal as it gets. So there I could, definitely could not say that shot to, uh, to my wife at, at, at all. <laughs> Oh boy. So do we have any questions that have come through yet? I'm Maybe I'll to... look at the, put on my glasses and see Raquel probably, probably has a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Nope. Raquel's thank you for being here, Raquel. We really appreciate you. Um, oh, most of the time she says a good observation that most of the time we fail to do our own due diligence. Yeah. Well, if it's related to self-assessment, you're, you're probably correct. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So Search Women fund. safeguard. Yes, search fund. Let's go. Let's talk about search funder. I think it is a great platform. There's a lot of um, mixed bag transactions from the high end to the low end. I think more high end though. Would you agree? If- I don't know. I mean, I've seen, I thought that originally too, but as I, I started looking at, I mean, I must have looked at a hundred posts or questions and um there's, I see a lot on the lower end. What I think the initial perception is, is because there's a disproportionate amount of people with fancy degrees and I don't shit on any degree. It's nice if you've got a, you know, an Ivy league degree and a, and a, and, and, and an MBA. I mean, I don't know how much value it brings you to the, to this process, but uh-huh. um, I think you get a preconceived notion that it's a higher end business, but there's a lot of lower market businesses. I mean, they're not, institutional buyers you know to me i'd say that the vast majority of them are businesses certainly 10 million dollars and under and plenty of them yeah. lower than that yeah i'm just gonna give a quick answer uh jack cox <clears throat> in our thread here asked what is the platform we're talking about searchfunder.com just and as it sounds like that that they're related to search funds they're buyers you know the community of prospective business buyers search mm-hmm. funders probably the most prominent one but there are some other ones as well i guess yeah that are, you know that have some uh, that those type of communities mm-hmm. so and Jack, there's a lot of uh, advisors on that as well. People such as Deb, myself, etc. Actually, no S at the end. Searchfunder.com. Yes, that that's the right website. Searchfunder.com, and I have seen everything from SBA lenders to uh, private equity uh, firms to people looking for an investment um, partner because they want to buy the business and be the manager, the, the, the operator on site. I mean, there's just a mixed bag of all kinds of opportunities on that platform. So there is a lot of value and you can learn a lot, but just understand where are you obtaining the source of your learning from hundred <laughs> percent. That's exactly it. It's this, right. it's this believable party syndrome. They're going back and forth about SBA loans. I saw one the other day when they were talking about earnouts and um, and it was a, a component to deal. And one person was talking about the SBA allows it. Another one says they don't allow it. A third one was telling them how to structure it to make sure it passes the SBA. And I wanted to tell them, hey, time out, idiots. Just let's stop here for a second, okay? You're not going to dictate to the um, to the lenders how things work. I, that I could guarantee you. The lender is going to tell you how they work and every lender is different. So, you know, what would be much better off the, is ask the question to someone like yourself and you'd set the record straight as to what is true. That's right. And so there's just so much, there's just a lot of, you know, um, there's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of misinformation. And again, I don't want to keep, I don't want to appear like I'm shitting on this website because it is a terrific (laughs) platform, but Uh you know, the, but the underlying theme that we're talking about here ties to what we're talking about, you know, get your information from the right people. Mm -hmm. No matter if it's financing, if it's business advisory, if it's accounting, If it's uh, legal, get your advice from the right people. You know, if you have a toothache, don't go to the shoemaker. So if you go to the dentist, and so that's where this gets, goes, goes off the rails, right? right. And, 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 you know, just get your advice from believable parties. And and just because the SBA SOP, Standard Operating Procedures, tells you so on earnouts, because there have been some changes as of the new release last fall, doesn't mean the bank you're working with is going to approve it and agree with what the SBA says. Right. They're, they're, the new changes that came out in fall uh, with the SBA SOP, the banks can say, no, we don't want to do it that way. And and I 
some banks and some of the new changes, I agree with them. I wouldn't want to do it that way either if I was giving out 90% capital on a transaction that's yeah, un unsecured. Right. It's unsecured. Right? right. And you know what? I think people should understand the, the SOP is the guidelines of which what they're allowed to do, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that they're going to do it. These right. are the things that they're allowed to do, but every lender is different. I mean, how many times have you, you, you stated that, you know, and, and you're right. We're talking SOP. I get a little Make, choked you get all, you get all, all <laughs> fuck, as they say on <laughs> SNL, all fuck clamped. You get all choked up. So, um, yeah. but, you know, you've made the point so often that, you know, being able to understand and diagnose the buyer and the business, it, you're able to direct people to the lender that or the lenders, lenders right. that are most likely going to be um, going to accept that that scenario, that buyer and that business, but it doesn't mean they all will by any means. So the scope of, you know, this, this what do you call it? The, uh, the standard operating procedures, uh -huh. I keep thinking mm -hmm. scope of work, but standard operating, those are parameters. Yes. Yeah. If one bank can, can do all that and the SBA will underwrite it, but doesn't mean that they're all going to do it and they all don't do it. So, I mean, that's yeah. the thing, right? Nothing. You don't have it. I, don't, I imagine you don't have everyone who complies with everything. It's, it's got to, you know, it's got to be a 10 out of 10 buyer, a 10 out of 10 business. And still that doesn't mean they may have their own internal rules. That's right. And then there are the SOP guidelines that the banks must follow. And if, if the deal goes bad, they lose their guarantee. Right. Yes. If the bank didn't follow and as crazy as it sounds, there are some banks that will take a little shortcut to get a deal done, depending upon the relationship or what have you. Right. No rhyme or reason in business acquisition lending. Not at all. Let's it's, talk about, if we can, for the attorneys and accountants piece yeah, of things. Please. So, you know, my um, my position is always when we talked about it earlier, you know, a few things that you should have in place. Meet with them early. Referrals are wonderful, especially if it's someone who has sold a business. Not every accountant or every attorney is going to be qualified to do your deal. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things, understanding, of course, their fees, any experience within similar related industries. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're, they're, they're valuable assets. Sometimes an attorney can recommend an accountant and vice versa. Um, you know, um, what is their, what is, have they done any work in this particular industry? What size mm -hmm. business? Is there any specialty? What's, you know, if it's a more complex business with um, certain components, like you need um, multiple leases or anything environmental or the mm -hmm. like, you typically need a larger firm where they have the resources in house. That's, that's part of it. Um, so again, it's a level of experience, familiarity. And you also want to know that the, that the attorneys have been people that do transaction law and their goal is to get the deal to the finish line, that they're deal makers and not deal breakers. Every attorney will tell you they're a deal maker, not a deal breaker, but you'll find out very quickly on in the conversation if they're dominant. Um, you know, you don't want someone who's, you want to he, them to impart their wisdom and recommendation, but mm -hmm. they're not the negotiator. You don't want them negotiating the deal, the buyer and seller negotiate the deal and the attorney is a scribe. They put down on paper what the buyer and seller have agreed to and over and above that put legal clauses in place to make sure your ass is covered and also may bring some other awareness to you. The accountant is someone who'll do the due diligence, but will also make sure the entity structure is right. And we'll look at certain things to make sure when they do their due diligence to make sure that they've done this before on this size business, that they're very thorough. They know what to look for, what issues they may be, because they'll help validate the information, um, the financial information. One thing I've told people, you know, when you get the first financial package, if it doesn't make sense to you as the buyer, sure as hell ain't going to make sense to the, the accountant. So you review it first yourself and you don't want to have to keep going to them to look at the P&Ls. Tell me what this, what this looks like. What are your comments? Because accountants typically value businesses, you know, on a, from a balance sheet and you mm -hmm. small businesses are, are valued based on the income statement, tax return. And so, you know, those in getting your team together, interview a lot of accountants, you know, three, four accountants, attorneys, recommendations are great, but make sure that you're compatible with them. Okay. Yeah. And then you know, and you want people that are going to help you get to the finish line. You, there are always an element of risk. You don't want to be so crazy and neurotic about it that you, you can never get a deal done. Cause you, you know, the attorney keeps telling you, oh, I'd never do this. I'd never do this. Attorneys typically, you know, some attorneys want a lot mm -hmm. of them want to, want to win every point, And that's not the case. A good transaction attorney understands it. you're pulling levers. It's, it's a give and take. Yeah. And some things you have to agree to other ones to let you know what your risk is and whether or not you're prepared to live with that. But you, the buyer, you know, you're, you drive the train. That's right. And I would like to add in about the attorneys as well. If you are going to use the SBA as the, as the buyer and, and have a bank loan backed by the SBA, make sure your attorney 
number one, knows SBA, and number two, wants to take on your transaction knowing that it is a loan backed by the SBA. Yes. There have been some attorneys out there that I have seen and heard when they hear SBA, they're like, I don't want to do anything with that. It's a headache. Right. Yeah. They think it's a headache or it's overwhelming. Jody asked the question, is it okay to ask for references when selecting advisors? Jody, I'm glad you're on this call because yes, 100%. And I should have mentioned that you absolutely want to get references. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And especially, I mean, ideally, if they have someone who had someone in a similar situation, business size or, or, or what have you, or type of industry, yes, there's no fear. Do you know, I understand the intimidation. Someone who's dealt with attorney going to fancy office, sometimes nice old wood paneling, mm -hmm. maybe it's a little, you know, it's, it, it can be intimidating, but that's, that sort of ties into you, the buyer, you control you control this deal. And yes, absolutely 100% ask for references unless it's, you know, the referral is someone who you trust implicitly and said, I've used this person to buy X number of business. Like one of the, you know, there's a few accounting firms that I use down here in South Florida have done for all my transactions. You know, I, I would recommend them to mm -hmm. anybody and say, if, you know, as long as they trusted me and say, you don't need references. These are terrific people. I mean, one guy did yeah. 20, 20 transactions with, but yes, ask for references by all mm -hmm. means. I and anybody who won't provide them run. There you go. I had a short list of uh, buyer representation attorneys, and there was one fella on the list that I had referred to over the years. And he was really, really good. He worked for a firm, did a great job, understood SBA, loved the guy. Then he went out on his own. He left the firm he worked for to start up his own firm and it just got messy. And then he got delayed. And then there were some personal issues at home, which slowed things down. And I had to pull him off the list, Richard. He just, he yep. was slowing my transactions down and the buyers were disappointed. If I'm going to recommend anybody, you better be good. And if I get any feedback that something has changed, you're coming off the list. Yeah. And, and you know what? And it's also important, you know, to that point is sometimes you get in bed with an attorney, they're not getting the job done. They're too slow. And I'm not saying just, you know, uh, brushing every attorney with this uh, paintbrush or whatever, but mm -hmm. or tarring every attorney with this, with this brush, which is, you know, it, sometimes it's not right and you find out early enough and you have to find someone else. That's and right. you know, what you don't want to do where I find that always happens, not with accountants, accountants, typically, you know, they've been well trained in auditing. They've been well trained in due diligence. They understand entity structure, tax structure, yeah. and that pretty much repeats itself firm to firm, even a smaller firm. I mean, that that's the core skill set you know, of an accountant. Mm -hmm. Attorneys on the other side, you get a lot of these door attorneys. You know what a door attorney is? Tell us, Richard. A door attorney is they practice law of whatever walks through the door, right? <laughs> That's a door attorney, and it's I love it, it. <laughs> it, and it, and it's common. So you want a transactional attorney, right? That's 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 their skill set. That's what they do. They may be too large for you, but you want a transactional attorney. They know the paperwork. They know what has to be done. They know the documentation. They know the issues to look for. You want a an, a transactional attorney, not a door attorney. I remember there's one attorney yes. down here. Good. I mean, it, it was like it, it. It seemed like every couple of years there was new signage on her building, right? Like when the foreclosures were busy, it was foreclosures. Then it was lawsuits against some, you know, some uh, uh, publicly listed companies. That it was like with it's typically the door attorney. I love you don't want you don't want one of those for sure. I do want to toss in quick as we're wrapping up our our time here. Uh, another advisor on your team, if you're a buyer and you're obtaining bank financing backed by the SBA, is the life insurance piece which always will slow down a transaction if your front end lender is not educating you to get the ball rolling on the policy that's going to um, cover the unsecured portion of your SBA loan. Uh, and everybody assumes going to my American family agent or state farm agent that I've been doing my personal and business insurance with for over 20 years is the answer. And they're going to be the fastest. And I'm just going to call them. And it's going to happen. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. You have to make sure you're finding uh, agents that understand how to put a collateral assignment on the policy and the, and the SBA parameters around it. And it has to be fast because some of these big companies, Richard, they can take months. If it's a $2 million policy, there's going to be blood drawn and health questions and yeah. searches done on the health of 
the borrower. And so that's the borrow. So just so I understand, the unsecured portion of an SBA loan has to have a matching uh, life insurance policy on the borrower. That is correct, and it it. So that way, it doesn't tra- the obligation doesn't transfer to their estate. It's paid off in the event of their death. That's right. Exactly. The banks want that protection. Uh, some banks, it just depends upon the underwriter. They may call for the whole loan amount, even if there is some collateral. Other banks really? will look at the unsecured portion and and condition it to be the unsecured amount. Again, so get started early. Different. Every bank's different. Yeah. So you got to get that process started early. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. All right. I think we're done with questions, Miss Deb. This was really engaging and great. Oh, How I- do you approach unconventional or challenging situations during the acquisition process? Well, Rocky, that's probably about 10 shows combined, <laughs> right? Um, because they're, and, but I think that's probably a good subject for one of our next ones to maybe pull a bunch of examples and maybe uh, uh, she could send us some direct message of some specific examples. But I think maybe it would be a, a good show pulling out some some examples of challenges that have happened that people don't anticipate. Well, it's all the challenges, are always stuff you don't anticipate, yeah. but but stuff that have have come up in situations where. Um, you know, how do you, how do you navigate your way around? That's probably a great question. That is and, a great question. I yeah. think of life insurance, the borrower yeah. forgot yeah. to get the ball rolling or the American family agent were on month two and we still don't have a policy assigned. What do we do? Well, I, I have contacts that will put it together quickly and, and put a policy in place within a couple of days. Will right. your premium be a little bit higher? Probably. Because you're paying for yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> and the other thing, by the way, when you're talking about insurance, reps and warranty insurance, which usually only was reserved for very large deal. But when you have a, a purchase agreement with a seller, there's clauses related to representations and warranties that the seller makes that you're, you're, you're both making to one mm-hmm. another related to um, things that you've said or documents you've provided. It's called reps and warranties and I urge people to learn more about that. But you can get insurance for reps and warranties that cover mm-hmm. any breaches in the reps and warranty. It used to only be for big deals. Now you could do it for much smaller deals as well. I have some terrific, con- I have one terrific contact actually, one above all the other ones who's, who's, who's really good if anybody needs that to, to let me know. But that's another thing you want to start early because as soon as my understanding that as soon as you have an LOI and the financials, they can get to work and they, they, they turn it around quickly, but they need that documentation. So it's something that, you know, a seller, um, buyers look at it, sellers look at it, um, to, to really, um, to really think about, cause it may, it, in most cases, the cost for that insurance is really inconsequential relative to the potential issues that could arise if there is a breach in the reps, um, representations and warranties. Wow. Wow. And See, I, in America, there's a business for every business. You write oh, a deal, you have man. reps and warranty, now you have reps and warranty insurance. And I'm sure there's a law firm in America that specializes in nothing but <laughs> suing rep and warranty insurance companies. You know, there's a business for That's every right. business. That yeah. should have been the title of this episode. We started it with, there's a business for every business there's and we're business. ending it that way. It is so true. Amen to so that. True. You're the best. I keep hearing from you as we're going to wrap up the show here. Uh, I have got contacts. I have contacts too. We've been doing this, Richard, for a long time. And we've seen the good, the bad, and everything in between. Yes, indeed. And that is where buyers need to slow down, get connected with Richard or myself, or you know, somebody that you know that you can get references on, that that you are comfortable that they've been doing this for a while and they're gonna set you up the right way before you start your search before absolutely the connections and and just having the credibility of those references and certainly anybody who has specific requests i mean by all means can get in touch with you or myself um and even if it's not someone you know if it may not be within the jurisdiction of what we're familiar with someone needs an attorney in, in you know in virginia who i may yeah. not know but if they can provide some background and people that they've spoken to. We could, you and I can both help them make sure that they get to the right people of questions to ask or whatever. I have a whole chapter in the course related to hiring professionals and questions you need to ask. And I'm sure when you, you know, someone is asking you for a reputable attorney related to closing a transaction with or without SBA, I'm sure you can give them, you know, very specific people that, that you would use. Absolutely. I know exactly what it would be. Yeah. And that's another topic, another episode 
the various laws in all the states. That's a whole nother can of worms. Woohoo! <laughs> yep, that's right. That's I'm right. And they differ. Maybe we'll bring one on. Uh, as a guest. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's a, that's actually a great idea. And I think, you know, some of the geographical differences would be very important. The good news yeah. for buyers is, you know, by and large, the transactions and the processes repeat themselves very closely state to state. There are certain things with bulk sales taxes or other issues, um, you know, that can be ge geographically specific. And that's why you want someone who's done a transaction in that area, or at least be vetted. If you have a decent enough size firm, even if they're outside the area, they have generally counseled that they can um, um, lean on within a certain um, state or what have you. And again, it all circles back to getting the, the right team, the right advisors, the right professionals. You got it. Yeah, there are there are searches on the subject business to be acquired. Um, um, searches as far as like tax liens, payrolls, stuff like that. And in every state, it's a different place to go to get those certificates that have to be collected and reviewed by the underwriter and cleared that it's approved and we can yep. close. Oh yeah. my God, I can tell you stories about. Oh yeah, and it's huge. And there's that sales tax issue. I guess the oh. next issue where you have to ta charge tax in certain states over a certain amount of revenue and a lot of companies mm -hmm. haven't done it. And there's clawbacks and buyers have to be aware of that because that that doesn't expire. Mm -hmm. And so that can come back to bite them in the ass. So all these things, I mean, we could list a, you know, a laundry list of, of potential issues. They can all be solved for. Yes. All of them. With but the you right have to team. Be, but you have to be aware of them. And if so, if you're, you're, you know, if you're not knowledgeable about the process and you don't surround yourself with the right people, I guarantee you, you're going to go about 150 miles an hour into a brick wall head first. That's a great way to close out the show, Richard. I mean, seriously, I would, I want to see everybody listening to what his words just were, because most of you searchers out there are doing it too fast and getting swooped up in, on the wrong side of the transaction, giving you recommendations on what to do and where to go. Start with the people on your side. That's where you got to start. Then go search. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what, what the, you know, the other thing is with the, what they teach in business school has nothing to do with buying a business. Yeah. That's, the, that's the reality. And I don't, you know, there's, there's, I've met a lot of brilliant people at, with, with, MBAs and graduate degrees, but the reality is, you know, in some cases, just because you're highly educated doesn't mean you know shit about acquiring a business. I mean, that's just the reality. So, yeah. you know, dedicate yourself um, with the same vigor that you put into your schooling to learn about the process. And then you, then you turn yourself into a, you know, in, in, into a superpower. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, All right, Ms. Deb. I think we wrapped it up here in, in good timing, 40 minutes, just over a little bit here. And we got another one coming up next Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern, streaming live on all your favorite social channels. Richard, you are the best. Um, you I can't say that because that was my line to you. I, you know, <laughs> I really, I, I, you know, I, the last couple of weeks have been disjointed and been traveling, or whatever, you know, so we've only spoken on the, the shows versus in between. I love spending time with you. Your wealth of knowledge, you're great. You're, you're fun. You're, you're, you're smart as hell and your, your heart is in the right place to help people. And I, I just really, I, you know that I, how much, I, how crazy I am about you. I feel the same about you. You make me smile. I missed you last week. So I'm glad to have you back. <laughs> it's good to be back. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening in and tune in next Thursday, 2 PM. We'll be back. See you later. <laughs>